Welcome to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. I'm Alan Arnold, and today we have a message from Stacy Eldridge. Just two weeks ago, we invited several women to the outpost, and Stacy gave a talk called Remember the Signs. Now, if you're a guy listening, don't tune out or think this is a message only for your wife or someone else. It's for you as well, guys, because what this is is really a message on learning how to embrace the new, what's next in life. We oftentimes recognize signs in nature of changing seasons. It's a little bit harder sometimes when we're in the middle of our own world to recognize the signs God has for what's coming, for what's next. But those signs can point us to Jesus. So that's what this message is about. It's for men, for women. If you happen to be there that night, it's worth listening to again. But for most of you, this will be your first chance to hear this message that could really change how you perceive this season of life. It's called Remember the Signs. Jesus, Jesus, we just want to settle in to your presence. So everybody, just even a, a big inhale and exhale, just a... We breathe you in, Holy Spirit. You are our life. You are our breath. You are our everything. And in our sanctified imaginations right now, we hand over to you to hold, even for a little while, all the cares that we are carrying, our worries, the things pressing against us, the people that we love, the hard situations going on in our life, all of it we hand to you to hold and to tend. And I ask that our hearts would be attentive to your spirit and to receive every good gift that you have for us tonight that you would stir our hearts in remembrance of who you are, what you've done, and who we are to you. And that from that place of stirring out of love, we encounter you in worship. So come, Holy Spirit, and fill this place. Fill us. Refresh us. In Jesus' name. Amen. I also want to welcome all of you that are joining us later through the RHTV, wish you were here with us, and you kind of are. And we're so glad that you, you are. So, hello. Yeah. Okay. Talking about things that I love, I'm going to dive right into things that I hate. <laughs> I hate endings. I hated the last day of our week-long summer vacation. It had been filled with with lingering mornings, quiet, slow mornings over coffee, and slow days free of responsibilities, and restful evenings that had nothing in them of preparing for the duties of the next day, nothing that is normally required. All the requirements that make up my life were far, far away, a galaxy away. The weather had varied on this week from baking heat under cloudless skies to the majesty of violent thunderstorms. The wind had been still, and the wind had knocked over trees, and the variety of it had been wonderful. The morning that we were packing up, that old Joni Mitchell song started playing in my head, Don't It Always Seem to Go, That You Don't Know What You've Got Till It's Gone. And I began to wonder, did I make the most of these days? Did I, did I drink in all the beauty that I could? Did I get all the goodness of it from it that was available to me? And I don't know about you, but when questions like that start to come into my heart, they make me sad because I was tempted to think that I'd been given the gift of a week away and somehow I had squandered it. But of course I had, and of course I hadn't. I can't possibly be keenly aware of all the beauty that is surrounding me at all times, every single moment. My soul isn't large enough or attuned enough to take it all in yet. I had to choose to believe that I hadn't blown it. I had received the gift of that time to the best of my ability, Resting, reading, praying, talking, being silent, 
And truly, I felt so much more refreshed at the end of that week than I had when I went into it. But I also felt like I was much more prepared to enjoy an entire banquet, and I had just been given the appetizer. I wanted more. And the taste of rest and beauty, it had touched a deep place in my heart, but it had not sated it. Rather, it had made me more keenly aware of my hunger. I was afraid, this is what the real thing was that morning, I was afraid that by leaving, I would also leave behind all the gifts that I had received, that they would be lost to me. I would enter into a new season of starvation that I've done it before, probably you have too, headed back into the valley from a mountaintop experience and weeks later forgotten the dizzying joys of the heights. It happens. And I want to hold on to the goodness. I, I want to remember. I need to remember. Because by remembering, I am assured that just as God promised, there is still good coming. I didn't know these days would be so rich. I don't know what's coming tomorrow either. Like you, like all of us, I can look forward with hope while at the same time holding sadness in my heart when joyful times come to an end. It's both. I can be gentle on my soul even when it grieves closings because the truth remains, I hate endings. I bet you do too. Anybody hate endings in this room? Yeah. At endings, there's this melancholy ache that presses against my heart and I have to choose to not give into despair. And often when endings come, they come with my tears. And I'll feel the sadness, but I am learning, I'm beginning to learn, to tell myself the truth that because of Jesus, the best is never behind us. Never. So we can live with expectant uncertainty. We don't know what's around the bends. But God does. And no matter what comes, no matter what, we can know, we do know, that our God will be there. He is our faithful, ever-present companion on every road we take. Yeah, time marches on. Time is a fleeting gift. I don't know how many days I have been given here, and neither do you. But I do know that by spending them in regret, my fist clenched to hold on to the goodness I do know, that prevents me from receiving the good gifts that God has in store for me in the future. Time spent in reflection is good. It's necessary. It buoys my heart to remember. I need to remember my God. He has been lavish with me. He's given me golden nuggets in the midst of the bleakest of times. And he doesn't change. If he has been lavish and generous and kind in the past, then won't he remain that way in the future? Yes. Yes, he will. Time spent remembering who God is, what he's like, and what he's done breathes life into my soul, whether my soul feels satisfied or starving. Time letting his living word wash over me infuses me with life and hope. That is the food that my soul and yours so desperately craves. The summer before last, the end of another week-long vacation, but this time spent with my whole family, I was also near tears. Did I mention that I hate endings? Yeah. My son Samuel and his wife Susie were the last to leave. And my son Sam is a sensitive soul. He is aware of what is going on beneath the surface of a happy face. And he knows me well. So when he hugged me goodbye, he whispered into my ear my favorite line from George McDonald's and Fantasties. All he said was, a great good is coming, Anatos. Go. 
coming to be. <sighs> the call to remember flows through Scripture. Remember the Lord your God. Remember the works He has done. If we forget, no better, when we forget who God is and what He's done and who we are to Him, we are in great peril. We can't live well or arrive well at the end of our journey if we don't remember. The endings are hard. They mark the close of a season, but they also mark the beginning. The new has come. The old has to go in order for the new to come. The scriptures say, God is putting a new song in my heart. He is always about the new thing. Okay. I'm sort of getting a little lost in my, myself and in my giddiness and passion over what I'm talking to you about. So I've got some notes up. Here they are. Ah, we need to remember the goodness that God has done. We need to remember what has happened. We need to remember his promises. What are we standing on? When we remember who he is and what he has promised for us, then we have the courage to be able to be open-handed and to step into the new. So I just wanted to remind us of just some of his promises. And this is fun. This is so fun. I, I highly recommend this. You know, you've got, you've got like a half hour or something. Just go into a concordance. Look at promises. There's so many. And it's just, it's rich. 1 John 2, 25. And this is the promise that he has promised us. Eternal life. It doesn't get much better than that. Isaiah 49, he says, I will contend with him who contends with you. I will save your children. That's a good promise. Luke 18, 27, we know that the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. It is true and a promise that there is nothing too difficult for him. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. (sighs) How about the Holy Spirit, John 16? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. That's a promise. We are not left alone. Philippians 4, 19, and my God shall supply all you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That is a promise. And it's a promise he will supply all we need. Okay, that doesn't always line up to all we think we need. But it is all we need. Psalm 84, 11, for Jehovah God is our light and our protector. He gives us grace and glory No good thing will he withhold from those who walk along his paths. James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. That's a promise. Psalms 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you will bear, but will make a way out for you. That's a promise. I want you to remember that one. Like tape it to my forehead. How about I will never leave you or forsake you? How about I have inscribed you into the palm of my hand and nothing can take you out? How about there's nowhere where you can go that God isn't already there? The depths of the sea, the depths of shale, the highest heights, you can't escape him. He's there already. How about nothing can separate you from his love? You can't. That is a promise. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. We have the promise of his presence, the promise of his peace. Revelations 21, 4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. There is an ending and a beginning that I am fervently looking forward to. 
Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. He continues to. Joshua 23, 14, not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God has promised concerning you. be done right there. Just let those marinate into your heart. Just, (laughs) what? That is really good. Surely I am with you always, even into the end of the age. I will never leave you nor forsake you. We need to let those assurances in because his continued presence, his promise of his continued presence will fill us with joy and peace. We need to remember in the silver chair, the silver chair, C.S. Lewis's, one of his book, his fifth or sixth book of Chronicles of Narnia, depending on how you count them. Aslan, the great lion, sends two children on a quest. Are you familiar with this one? To help them on what is a life-threatening, dangerous journey, Aslan gives one of the children four signs to follow. She has to remember them. The quest will fail if she does not remember them. She's to share them, recite them, speak them aloud, remind herself of them before she goes to sleep, when she wakes up, because they are essential for her to be able to fulfill their quests and be triumphant. Let me just actually read. It's a short little place where Aslan is going back to remember. But first, remember, remember, remember the signs. Say them to yourself when you wake in the morning and when you lie down at night, and when you wake in the middle of the night. He's telling her to remember the promises, remember the truth. And whatever strange things may happen to you, let nothing turn your mind from following the signs. And secondly, I give you a warning. Here on the mountain, I have spoken to you clearly the signs. I will not often do so down in Narnia. Here on the mountain, the air is clear and your mind is clear. As you drop down into Narnia, the air will thicken. Take great care that it does not confuse your mind. And the signs which you have learned here will not look at all as you expect them to look when you meet them there. That is why it is so important to know them by heart and pay no attention to appearances. Remember the signs and believe the signs. Nothing else matters. An allegory for us. If Jill forgets them, it may cost them their very lives, let alone their victory. I told you it was a dangerous journey. He sent them on, and so is yours. So is yours. We must remember the signs. When a vacation finally comes, when it's over, in the midst of celebration and in the middle of mourning, during times of great loss and pain and during times of great joy, The call to remember flows through scripture. And there are many ways that help us to remember. We're remembering together tonight. That's why we're here. That's why you have the energy to get in your car and choose to come because you want to remember. But one of the ways that helps us to remember that is constantly around us, if we will but have the eyes to see, is found in nature. Creation shouts the glory of the Lord. It speaks of his character, his power, his goodness, his beauty, his splendor, his majesty. I love the psalm that says, the trees of the hills clap their hands in joy. It's so good to look at a tree with new eyes and see its limbs waving and knowing. It's just exulting in God. I love to go for walks in the morning. 
long walks in the hills near our home. And we're so blessed to get to live where we live. I just got back from a trip in Southern California and I, I kissed the ground when I, the, thank you. I bless you, people. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love to go for walks in the morning. Maybe you do too. Long walks. It's my prayer time. It's my centering time. It's my sacred time with God before I enter into the fray of the day. And for the past year, many of you know, because of my hip injury, I, I couldn't. I wasn't able to go for walks. And I was relegated to looking at nature through the confines of my windows and my porch. But look, I did. And yes, I am eager to go for long walks again and to be able to have the strength to hike. I'm not quite there yet, but I was able to walk a mile today. For those of you who don't know, I had hip replacement surgery in, at the end of June. And I am just, I'm thanking God for this hip every single day. <laughs> to be able to do and regain all my strength is a ways off yet. And in the meantime, when my soul cannot be nourished completely in the wild garden of my creator, he is inviting me to new ways, new ways. But for all of us, all of us, one of the key ways is in his creation and simply going out side. 93% of the average American person's life is spent indoors. 93%. For the average um, child under the age of 18, they spend less than 20 minutes outside every day and more than seven hours in front of some kind of a screen. They are not exposed to green trees and open vistas and air free from the sound of horns and radios blasting. Their lives are spent mostly in cities, mostly indoors, and their souls are spent in the desert. And it does them great harm, as it does us if we live that way. That's why there are whole ministries devoted to get people out into the wilderness, particularly inner city children, because it does them such a great good. That's why gardens are tend tended in the midst of tenements. The soul needs green in order to green up itself. They've measured. You need at least 20 minutes outside a day. People who spend that much time a day or more, their mood is elevated. They're happier. Their ability to concentrate and absorb information increases two to five times. They need less medication. Academically, they do better. Socially, they do better. Physically, obviously, they do better. We need it. It speaks of who God is, and we need to drink it in. Sometimes, sometimes we're in seasons where nothing seems to penetrate our heart. Or we're in times of deep grief and sorrow or overwhelmed and nothing is helping. The only thing that will help is beauty. Beauty will minister to your soul when it seems that nothing else can reach you. So I have been finding ways to drink in beauty. Our souls crave nourishment and they will be sated. They will either in God or outside of him. One way is going to bring sustenance and goodness, and the other only a deepening craving and a wandering further away from the life we need. We must remember and follow the signs. And all the signs point to Jesus. All the signs point to the cross. All our roads Ultimately, first, they lead to the crucifixion of our own dreams, of our own um, dreams, specifically of a pain-free life, or our own dreams that every dream is going to be fulfilled here and now. And when we reach that inevitable end of learning that they're not, we reach the end of ourselves, and we're met with a choice. 
We can make the cynical decision that all life is empty. It's an empty thing. The only promise is pain. Or we can look for a deeper, higher fulfillment of our heart's truer desires. And those desires, those are all met in the resurrection and in the hope that's found only in the death and life of the King of Kings, Jesus. There are promises for life. There are promises for this life. I've just read you some of them. There's a zillion more. No picture just thinking of them now. I've come that you might have life and life to the full. I mean, there's a zillion and they're fantastic. And we have to know them and understand them and remind ourselves of them and speak them aloud and share them and say ourselves them in the morning or when before we go to bed and in the middle of the night. We have to remember there are signs that point to the expansive, immeasurably good heart of God. We have to look for them sometimes. And we must remember. I love this quote. I think this is from Epic. We live in a love story. I'm reminding you. We live in a love story. We are created for romance, and we have an insatiable capacity for it. Now, God gave us such a heart. It was one of his first gifts to us. You have to have a heart to live in a love story. Then he gives to us this world that is so breathtakingly beautiful. The earth is filled with the love of the Lord. And you see it in the fact that he made grass just firm enough that it stands up straight like a carpet, but not too firm that it hurts you when you run on it with bare feet. And he makes snow just firm enough for snowballs and sledding, but not so firm that it hurts us when it falls. It falls so softly. He makes birds and their songs just loud enough to be delightful. And he creates our ear to delight in the sound. Do you begin to see the tenderness and the love of God through all creation? All of this is the love of God wooing you. Some of you found the romance of God at the beach. Some of you found it in the rivers or in the meadows. Some of you found it in books. All that has ever stirred your heart, that was God romancing you. For as the Bible says, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. We have to remember that the secret of happiness is this. God is the love you are longing for. We are remembering together tonight. There are rhythms to life. There are rhythms in nature. I think you've guessed that I'm a summer girl myself. My soul greens up when surrounded by the burgeoning of life around me. But even I, who dreams of eternal summer, knows that my enjoyment of it is both heightened by and dependent upon its more chilly cousins. There are seasons. Heaven is coming. Eternal beauty, and yes, all things made new. Nature teaches us this. It teaches us so many things, but but it instructs that the lessons learned from the seasons should not be ignored. He gave them to us for a reason as well. Nothing is by accident. The slumber of winter, the promise of spring, the glory of summer, the bounty of autumn, the rhythms of repose and exaltation, starkness and abundance, death and life. It surrounds us for the ongoing purpose of reminding us the truth about the nature and needs of our life, of our life on this dangerous journey. Scrub oaks. Those of us that are here know this, but those of you watching perhaps don't, that scrub oaks cover the hills in the front range of Colorado. They're the last to leaf out, stubborn in their arrival in summer, and then their leaves fall in the blustery winds that signal summer's ends. But oh, they're marvelous. The soft, virgin, lime green leaves that bud out in spring, they're velvet to the touch. 
After so long a season of barrenness, when I see them emerge, it just causes my breath to catch in my throat. And then suddenly, when I'm not looking, they fill out, exploding with green. They soak up the sun with their abundant life, and they cover the hills like a carpet of emeralds. The canopy of deep summer, that's their playground. They provide shelter for the newborn, gangly, spotted fawns. And a home, a nesting place for the hummingbirds as soon as they arrive. And then, end of August, comes this shift in the wind, a hint on the breeze, a fragrance in the morning that I am generally not ready to admit, and the leaves of the scrub oak begin to turn. First hint of yellow, of gold around the edges. It warns that like gypsies, these leaves are not going to stick around long. Oranges and reds begin to engulf the green like hungry flames. It is the scrub oak's swan song, autumn. And autumn patchwork replaces the solid sea of jade, jade. And we know the quilt is not going to last long. In the Rocky Mountains, Autumn falls as quickly as a shooting star, but oh, it is beautiful while it is here. The wind blows harder. The leaves come down, dry now, littering the landscape with their final goodbye. And then the branches are naked. The view from them and through them no longer blocked. And winter comes. And when the snow falls Softly, it lands on them gently, dusting one side with a powdered sugar grace. And when it's very cold, they become embroidered with icy crystals. But mostly, mostly they are naked, brown, empty. It takes an effort to see the beauty that remains. Sometimes for me, it takes a sheer act of will to bless them in their starkness. They look dead, but of course they're not. In the winter, the plants are simply slumbering. They're settling deep inside their brown limbs and resting so that they may burst forth with life and fullness once again. We may look like winter. We may feel like winter. Our souls sometimes grow cold and weary, and when they are, we are being invited to rest, to have a season where our soul, the roots of our soul, go deeper into the rich soil of God's love in order to be strengthened and replenished. Winter speaks of rest. It reminds us that our souls need it too. The seasons are changing, my friends. School's begun, the golden leaves are being sprinkled in. Higher up in the hills, the yellows far outnumber the greens now. There are reds and oranges and brilliant primary colors are ablaze against what is often a crystal blue sky. And it's stunning. And on its heels, winter is coming. Indoor days of coziness and outside days of brisk air. Maybe a blizzard or two. No more flip-flops, snow boots. Maybe the flu. Hopefully, warm soups and fires. Nights falling earlier. Darkness and cold and stars that shine out all the brighter because of it. And the invitation to remember that our souls need to be nourished. And nourished with rest. And to remember that in every season, every season, every single season, in nature and in our lives, there is a unique beauty and the presence of God in it. Nature speaks of the signs. The passing of seasons speaks of the signs. Vacations tell of the signs. Tastes of beauty and tastes of hunger are a sign. Pain And life speaks of the signs. They point to Jesus. They are meant to be invitations. Every loss we endure speaks of every gain we are meant to have. 
every grief speaks of the joy we are created for. Every betrayal speaks of the faithfulness we are meant to live in. Every ending speaks of the eternal beginning. And every goodbye speaks to the grand hello. Celebrations in life speak of the sign. Simply because of Jesus, we have so much to celebrate. I'm about to become a grandmother for the first time, any day, and I can't wait. And new life speaks of the signs. We say goodbye to our dear friend and father to many, Craig McConnell on August 1st, and the pain of his passing speaks of the signs. We are not meant for goodbyes. We are not meant for endings. We are uncomfortable with the passage of time. We're not created for death. But even death speaks of the signs. There is death. But remember that after death, there is life. There is winter. But after winter, there is spring. There is the crucifixion. And after the crucifixion, there is the resurrection. After the final goodbye, there is the unending hello. Our God has gone before us into all things. And somehow, miraculously, he promises that in all things, he's going to use it for our good. Always. He's present in all of it, to to all of it. And he is growing us up so that we can be as well, present to it, present in it. Because just as winter heightens my joy of summer, so goodbyes heighten the anticipation of my hellos. I'm going to show one other scene tonight. It's from the movie Shadowlands. And it's a picture of being present in the moment to all of it, holding the hope, awake to the grief, at the same time. C.S. Lewis's wife, Joy, is inviting her husband to remember. One of the ways that God wooed him throughout his life as a young boy was through a picture that was on his nursery wall of the golden meadow. And she has cancer. She doesn't have a long time to live. She's in remission. She's doing well at this moment. But she wants her husband to awaken and remember God's wooing and be present to it. Let's watch the scene. Every year, God reminds us through the seasons that there are seasons, there are rhythms, and he calls us to be awake to it all. Not afraid, not afraid, but alive. He has gone before us. He's going before us now. He's before us, behind us, and within us. And our Jesus, our Jesus has suffered in every way that we suffer. He is acquainted with grief. And there is not a moment in your life, not even in the moment of your passing to heaven, that you are alone. You have a faithful companion who goes before you, behind you, within you, who promises to never leave you or forsake you, who has promised that he has suffered in ways you never will so that you never will have to. And he has won on your behalf eternal life. The life that you have always wanted, the life that you were born to where your every longing will be fulfilled and your every dream will come true, all because of Jesus. So in obedience and with hope, we can remember and we can and I can say yes 
to the next season. Yes to the new. Yes to believing that God is good and has good in store. Yes to trusting his heart. Yesing him. Yesing, that's our new verb. Yesing. Yes to letting our sorrow at goodbyes deepen our soul's dependence on him. Yes so that the goodness that awakens our hunger leads us to the only one who will satisfy our souls. Yes, to Jesus. We are able to say goodbye to seasons, even to loved ones with an open hand and welcome every new season, knowing that Jesus has won. So Jesus, help us to do that. Help us to remember you, please. We do trust you. Help us to trust you more. A great good is coming, beloveds. Coming to you. That was Stacey Eldridge from a recent Women at the Well event. The topic, Remember the Signs. Next week, we'll start a whole new series with John and Stacy Eldridge and Morgan and Sherry Snyder. The four of them will be talking about soul care, and it will be a multi-part series on how we can nurture, understand, and take care of really what matters most, our heart and soul. Until then, I'm Alan Arnold, and we hope to see you back next week on the Ransomed Heart Podcast. <laughs>